So here's the thing. Do we have different Bibles? Is there a different Bible in Canada versus the US? Is there a different Bible in France? Well, it is in French, but is it a different Bible? No, yet radically different perspectives on climate change. Where do these different perspectives come from? They do not come from the Bible. So where do these religiously sounding objections come from? They are window dressing. They are palatable excuses for what? For I don't want to fix it. You know, there might be something worth talking about in this clip. Let's get into things. Welcome to the Enemies Within the Church podcast. You can go to enemieswithinthechurch.com right now to view the documentary if you haven't already. Or you can click on the store icon at the top, buy a copy, give it to a friend if you've already watched it, buy several copies. We also have our brand new small group curriculum that came out. Uh, Yes, it's based off of the film, but more than that, it's definitely more uh, expansive and it meant for... Uh, the purposes of engaging with and growth rather than simply the more informative letting you know what's going on that the documentary was. So it's it's a complement to that and expands upon it. Well worth it. Definitely should check that out. You can also go to EWTCnews.com. Again, EWTCnews.com. That stands for Enemies Within the Church News to stay up to date on the things that we have going on. That includes articles that are a little bit more current events focused, although here at Enemies Within the Church, we want to be more about the analysis of things than simply just presenting what happened. So we try and give you that perspective on things uh, to help you understand and break it down a little bit. Go there. This podcast is a part of that project, the continuing project of Enemies Within the Church. And make sure you stay tuned for all the fun announcements that will be coming out over time. We are not going away. We have lots of projects in the works. But before we get into this week's episode, I want to I want to mention a couple things. First, what we're going to be doing today is not looking at a a ridiculous clip and in a longer form going, wow, that's ridiculous. It's going to be pretty evident that it is ridiculous. But what we want to do here, what we try and do every time we, we look at something is break it down a little bit more to understand what's at play. We want to be able to understand it so that we can grow ourselves We can be a little bit more aware of how uh, these ideas are being infiltrating into the church, um, how to resist that, stand up to that. Uh, But also a big, big one is understanding these things so that we can help the people that they are taking advantage of. We want to be strong, not just for ourselves, but for others. We want to rescue others from these deceptions. We also want to look at some of these more obvious things to prepare us to understand the less obvious things and help people, again, help other people understand what's going on. Hey, when they say X, Y, and Z, we need to know what they mean by that. Do you know what they mean by that? Uh, you're starting to buy into the bigger idea of what they're saying, but but do you understand what it's resting upon? Do you understand their actual beliefs, what they're actually trying to get you to believe? It's important to have this foundation. But I want to present something to you. We've looked at Preston Sprinkle several times over the past several weeks and even further out than that. And in doing all the different research that keeps bringing me back to him, whether it's dealing with the crew situation, and of course he's there, or just some of his own uh, antics. I want to, I've been doing a lot of research. And every time I dive into something uh, from one of his, his ministries or something he's involved with, it's more ridiculous than the last. Now I know He is popular in conservative circles, or at least, quote, conservative circles. We won't make a distinction on that right now, but 
He's also very popular in organizations, institutions, very much in many, many schools. Um, So my question to you, would it be useful for us to begin a podcast and article series where we dive more into Preston Sprinkle uh, and a lot into his content and a lot into some of the more uh, ridiculous things as you get further away from the the very public side of him and his teaching and you get a little bit more deeper. Would that be something that is valuable to take some time to do? I need that feedback. We need that feedback before we engage in that project. Now, that wouldn't necessarily be every episode for you know however long, but just over the course of, of time, maybe once a month, do an episode trying to break this down in the hopes of giving people a foundation for clearly communicating to others why Preston is a problem, why his beliefs are problematic. Uh, if that would be helpful, if that'd be useful, please let us know. You can comment on YouTube, on Rumble. You can reply. Uh, there, there's always just an open reply question on Spotify. You can do it there. I don't know if some of the other podcast platforms let you directly communicate like that. If they do, that's great. If not, you should jump to one of those other platforms to let us know. It's the quickest and easiest way it also lets others see as well so that there can be a little bit more of um an understanding uh and help others to to kind of gauge what what people are seeing if that would be something useful go ahead and let us know but let's jump into things so this is going to center on a clip from katherine hey hey ho my if you say it too fast, it just becomes, hey Um, who is a climate scientist and also claims to be an evangelical Christian. Now, probably wouldn't really care if that was it, but she is, you know, kind of on the same, same vein as Preston. She's used in Christian institutions. She spoke at uh, Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. The clip we're looking at here is from uh, Seattle Pacific University, uh, which is a Methodist-aligned or historically Methodist-aligned, not United Methodist, um, school and seminary. But... It, it, so that, that's the purpose. We want, we want to look at her because she's being used, is particularly being used to train up and educate our young people. <laughs> that's a problem. But there's some, again, there's useful things for understanding some of these ideologies. So let's, let's jump into it. Let's jump into it and watch this, this short clip. It's only uh, four minutes long. Uh, and it will give us a, a foundation for having a good conversation. So here's the thing. Do we have different Bibles? Is there a different Bible in Canada versus the U.S.? Is there a different Bible in France? Well, it is in French, but is it a different Bible? No. Same Bible, same God. And in fact, you see this in the U.S. with Hispanic and white Catholics, same Pope, yet radically different perspectives on climate change. Where do these different perspectives come from? They do not come from the Bible. So Perfect. where do these religiously sounding objections come from? They are window dressing. They are palatable excuses. For what? For I don't want to fix it. Because if I Perfect. say there's this global issue that affects us all, but it's affecting the poorest and the most marginalized people worst, what would we all think Jesus would say about that? In fact, there's a National Association of Evangelicals report on climate change called Loving the Least of These. Not good, right? But, but if we don't want to fix it, then we have to make up a pious sounding reason why we don't want to fix it. 
So this is what we do. We make up these reasons. So in responding to those reasons, I don't go to the science. I would go to the Bible. And so for the people who say, well, God's in control, so nothing like this, you know, why would this happen? I just go to Genesis 1, where it says God gave humans responsibility over every living thing on this planet. In fact, that was why we were created in God's image. And for the people who say, well, responsibility, that's translated have dominion over. I say, okay, let's just go to the Hebrew word rada. And if we go to elsewhere in the Old Testament where the word rada is used, it refers to God as a ruler having dominion over people to do what? To crush them into the ground and extract every penny of value from them? No. It says God will rada over them to listen to the cries of the needy to help the helpless, to care for people. That is what that word means. And then to the people who say, well, the world's gonna end anyways, why does it matter? It's so interesting because people 2000 years ago were people. And back then there were people, especially in Thessalonica, who were essentially checking out of life. They were saying, well, the world's gonna end anyways, Maranatha, come Lord, come. They were just sort of quitting their jobs and putting their feet up in the easy boy chair of life. And the Apostle Paul wrote to them and basically said, get a job, care for the widows and the poor, support your family. You don't know when the day and the time is. And in the meantime, paraphrasing a few things here, we are called to express our faith through love, love to others. Like Jesus said, his disciples were to be recognized. So there's no theological basis for any of this denial. It is all excuses religious -y sounding window dressing excuses to cover the real problem, which is my politics doesn't want to fix it. People have pinned their identity on, as the Bible calls it, the flesh, rather than who they are. So that's why when we do talk about these issues, as I talk about in that global weirding episode, we can address their objections on the surface, but we immediately have to pivot and address the underlying objections. And the underlying objections have nothing to do with God, sadly, and everything to do with, I don't want to fix it because I'm afraid it means they would be taking away my truck, my car, my whatever, my something I care about would be taken away from me. And that's why we have to talk about how the fact that there are solutions that are good for us. There are solutions that <laughs> give us more. There are solutions <laughs> that help us be an even better version of who we already are. The solutions, cannot be just about loss because we humans, we fear loss more than we value gain. And so when we show people that there are solutions that we can benefit from, our health, our well-being, even the economy, that addresses the underlying issue and the religiously sounding excuses go away. I, I, I'm sorry to kind of... Like I said, we don't want to just make fun of things. That's not, that's not the purpose here. So I'm sorry I kind of burst out laughing. But even have watched this before, it still catches me so off guard that she'll just go right from we're going to take stuff away from you to but you'll have more. It's literally the uh, <laughs> you'll have nothing but you'll be happy. I, I, I can't believe that someone can be so just unaware and can so be so absolutely condescending. And that, that's something that needs to be mentioned in this because uh, when this clip, which this clip was put out there by Woke Preacher Clips, um, on Twitter and you can look at responses and a lot of people comment on this. So I, I want to address it, which is, uh, the eyes. She's got crazy eyes. And that is true. You know, you can look at her and you can go, there's something wrong right now with this person. But rather than just simply saying she has crazy eyes. Let's put a more constructive label on what is going on. So one, listen to the tone of her voice, because it's not just coming from her eyes. We as humans pick up on a lot of pieces of communication that go beyond the words that are being said. 
obviously facial expression, but tone of voice, uh, just how someone's head is angled. All these little things come together and we pick them up subconsciously. They help us understand what the person is communicating. So it's not just the eyes, it's the whole attitude, the way she carries herself. And when she's talking about uh, when she's talking about the people that she is against, she's very animated, higher up, wide-eyed, tone of voice becomes condescending, and again, even literally puts the head up to be, again, put a condescending, talking down to attitude on. It's very much the, you're so ridiculous, I'm not even going to give you the time of day, yet I'm going to get animated in uh, responding to you. I really don't like using this term, uh, and I, I'm going to honor my, my uh, high school friend's dad, who was on a one-man crusade on Facebook to redeem the name Karen, because that was his wife's name. Uh, but it is that sort of attitude, that, that entitlement of, I can belittle you, not give you the time of day, yet at the same time, it's obvious that I'm incredibly upset by this. It's that sort of attitude, that attitude of, I must justify myself by tearing you down. Now, let's put a little bit more legs on that. Before we move on, let's put a little bit more legs on that. Last week, we talked about the 3D strategy, deny, deflect, discredit. She is very much operating in that paradigm. She, she's, well, we don't really get the deny as much, especially since we're partway through a, a, a speech, but you can still see the idea that she doesn't even want to address the facts of the matter. She just wants to condescend. Uh, Obviously, very much going into deflect. What's the question at hand? Pff, that's irrelevant because we can just, you know, we don't have to do this. We don't have to do that because these people are just wrong. And obviously, that gets into discredit. She wants to paint her opponents as these just complete idiots that know nothing. And she is so much superior to to the point where she doesn't need to actually provide substance for her claims because these people are so far beneath they're, they're you know, they're beneath logic. They're beneath uh, reality. They're beneath the Bible. Even they're so far gone. <clears throat> now, one thing we don't want to have that attitude. We don't want to have that attitude. Anything we do life in general, but also in this fight against these different ideologies, the different, quote, woke ideologies, these expressions of cultural Marxism that have been infiltrating into the church. We don't want to have that attitude. We want to be, as Jude says, we want to be, uh, we want to be helping those who are being caused to doubt. We want to save others by snatching them out of the fire. And yeah, there is a time when we have to show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. But we want to be really focused on the first two. We want to be rescuing people. We can't do that if our attitude is condescension. We can't play their game. It's okay at times to poke fun at the ridiculousness of something. There is a benefit to satire and humor. But we don't want to slip into simple condescension. We don't want to put ourselves up as superior because we're not going to rescue any, anybody in that sense. We're not going to change anybody's minds. So that's what we want to do. We don't want to behave how she was behaving. Now, notice what she includes in there. She includes digs at uh, different theological perspectives. She includes digs at capitalism. Uh, the exploiting people for money. Um, <clears throat> she includes digs at ownership, private property, that these are things in the way of saving the climate. 
her presentation of the I don't want to go over this one, spend a bunch of time on it, but her presentation of what's going on in Thessalonians is. Um, let's just call it a caricature. Uh, and the fact that she mockingly uses uh, Maranatha is, um, frankly, I'd say a little bit offensive. Uh, we want to be hopeful in the coming of our, our Lord. Uh, yeah, that's something that's, it's, I don't know. I don't know. There, there's a, a very negative attitude she has that seems to go far beyond Christians and it really becomes Christianity in general and the Bible and God and God's word. There's an attitude there that's uncomfortable. Now, if you're someone who is, let's talk about this. If you're someone who who is questioning some of these things, who's going, man, I don't know what to believe about the climate. And this person is an expert. And, you know, she she's saying these things that, oh, wow, on the science side of, of things, climate change, oh, but on the, the theological as well, we're supposed to, like, care for... Um, the environment. In fact, that's why God made us to care for the environment. Now, you're not going to have that. The person who's in that situation is not going to have that conscious thought. But that's just these sort of thoughts that can be operating in their mind. Well, how, how do we defeat the, this Marxist climate change attitude? What she's pushing, that the solution to climate change is to implement socialism, to implement a Marxist philosophy, to take away private ownership of things, to, in fact, voluntarily surrender that for the the sake of the sacredness of the planet. Exactly. She does present the planet as sacred. She presents it as something that is above humanity. And she tries to, she realizes she does that in the whole uh, uh, Dominion commentary she gives. She realizes she did that. She realizes that she put uh, humans as underneath, inferior to the planet. That we're simply here as God's gardeners to take care of of his uh his planet and specifically in an environmentalist sense and then she had to go oh wait back up but people are going to point out that that's not the word the word is dominion so then she has to create a a new definition let's actually examine <laughs> what what is the word that she's trying to use now let's put something in from from last week the 3d strategy there was an important question that we brought up of how to deal with, with that strategy. Does the response answer the question at hand? Does it actually address the concern? So that's something to look at in this. Now, it's the, the question at hand is a little bit more abstract because she's creating she's creating a a question uh, that she then begins to answer so it is a little bit more abstract but we can still apply that logic of is she actually responding to the objections i think it's obvious she's not but let's look at it let's look at it so let's talk about the word dominion Let's talk about the word dominion. Is she being honest about that or is she being manipulative? Now, here, here's a question. How many of you would go, okay, yeah, she's, she's getting it wrong. How many of you would do that? I'm assuming a lot of you would just assume she, she's wrong. How many of you, uh, if you're being really honest with yourself, would actually go out and look up the word? 
How many of you, again, being try and be honest with yourself, how many of you would just completely miss what she said there? Because you're focused on, on some of the other parts. How many of you might miss that or did miss that uh, when, when it was being played? Again, put put yourself in that, and then and then imagine that more, her more targeted audience, because she's not going after someone who is more alert and aware. She's going after someone who is paying less attention. She's going after someone who is, well, from the greater Seattle area, who's been just beaten down with environmentalism, despite oh my goodness that area. The liberals ramble on about climate nonsense and then continuously build housing developments on some of the most fertile land in the country. Just, ah, gosh, it's so frustrating. You really want to be an environmentalist? Let's support farmers. That's how you actually take care of things. But. Again, her target audience is the people that aren't going to fact check her. Her target audience is the people that might question her a little bit, but aren't going to really dig into it. They're not going to ask the question that we put forth of, does her response answer the question at hand? So let's talk about the word uh, Rada. <clears throat> Rada. Um in the, the KJV, because we're just using a basic strong uh, definition here. We don't need to do a deeper word study than that. We're just trying to get a basic picture. It's used uh, rule, dominion, take, uh, prevaileth, reign, rule. The outline of the biblical usage. To rule, have dominion, dominate, tread down. <laughs> Oof. Uh, to have dominion, rule, subjugate to cause, to dominate, to scrape out. Uh, I, I gotta be honest, it's not looking good for her. It's not looking good for, for her portrayal of this. It, it's a primitive root. It means to tread down, i.e. subjugate, specifically to crumble off, uh, come to, make to, have dominion, prevail against, Rain, bear, make, to rule, over, take. Um, is this this presentation of this word of of it being a you know God as a Marxist liberator that's coming to um, have dominion over in the sense that. Let's let's expand on that a tiny bit, because she's she's presenting it in the style that uh, Marxism has always been presented, which is the promise that the quote oppressed, if they give over their their power, if they join in with the Marxist revolution, that they'll be liberated from that oppression. And she's that's how she's selling uh, Rada. But with, what is the reality? The reality is that you get someone who takes an actual definition. Now, there are both good and bad definitions. There's good and, pro good and bad usage of Rada, like most words. You can have a good leader, a bad leader. But they get a leader that actually fits the definition of Rada. And it's not a benevolent one. They get a Joseph Stalin. That's the lie of Marxism. It says, we'll, we'll save you. We'll liberate you from oppression. But then it only oppresses you more. But... <laughs> I'm... I, it hurts. It hurts to look at some of the stuff and it hurts that people struggle to see it, struggle to see the manipulation. But worse than that, they struggle to see how that that manipulation, these ideas are not isolated. 
They have tendrils that snake out and are getting into so many other things. This is such a ridiculous, over-the-top, easy-to-see example, but it is not isolated. There are people that are pushing, pushing the boundaries when it comes to uh, different ideologies, when it comes to a radical alarmist view of climate change. Now, we could talk about some point we do need to talk about narrative counter narrative because there's a problem that people fall into that actually hurts us quite a bit we'll talk we'll definitely talk about that in an episode but we need to really understand the way that she's manipulating things it, it, what does god define as man's dominion is it this you know, oh, we're just we just to have be there as these these subtle caretakers and um, we're subservient to nature. Well, again, we could if you're looking at it on the video right now, you can see some of the usage of it. And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful, multiply uh, and replenish the earth and subdue it. OK, well, we, now we've got more than just Rada, we've got subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every level living thing that moveth upon the earth. Okay, there's some added definition there. Uh, there's more than just... There's more than just rata. And that's one of the things she's doing. She's trying to reduce it just to one word. But the word exists in context. Uh, Leviticus 24, 43. Thou shalt not rule over him with rigor, but shalt fear thy God. <clears throat> so it, it is about more than just... I. I I'm not even clear on her definition of it because she wants to, she wants to simply point it in a direction, but again, without, because she can't go in the definition because she made one up. She only tries to give you a little bit. Uh, Leviticus 26, 17, and I will set my face against you and ye shall be slain before your enemies. Uh, they that hate you shall reign over you, shall rada over you, and ye shall flee where none pursueth you. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion and shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. I I got to be honest. Where is this? What where where is this definition that that she's putting forth? It's not there. It doesn't exist. It's a myth. So that's that's a problem. She's defending an idea using lies. But this is why it's important to ask the question. This is why I stressed it so much last week. Asking the question, does her response answer the question at hand? No, it doesn't. It's all deflecting from the issue. It's all trying to discredit those who would come against her. It's manipulation. But as I said, she, she, she is ridiculous. We've established that. Anyone that's willing to lie to get their way is ridiculous. Is, well, obviously untrustworthy. So why is someone like this being brought in to educate, to lecture to people who are going to be, some are just, you know, universities as well, not just seminaries, but we get a mix of people who are trying to pursue 
education in a Christian environment. We get people who are becoming pastors of churches that are being educated by this person. That's really concerning. So this is not something that's going to go away. They might look at her and go, okay, yeah, that seems a little bit extreme. But if she's done her job, she's moved people a little bit further. She's got them to start asking wrong questions. This is an important, a key thing. They want you, the extreme versions want to get you to ask wrong questions. Then when the person they've influenced is asking wrong questions, they in they uh, bring in some of that ideology, and then they communicate it down the line. So yeah, you get a diluted version, but it's still getting transmitted. It's spreading further and further. This is why we got to be careful. And this is why we can look at a ridiculous example, but then we go, okay, where is this popping up? Where is this popping up? Where, what is the downstream of her? Is that affecting things? Do we see Christians? We see pastors. Do we see in institutions, in denominations, uh, in individual churches, in individual Christians? Do we see them going, yeah, maybe we need to, to make some some big changes because of of climate change. Maybe we need to to you know decrease certain you know like carbon emissions and things like that. You know God did. Ah oh, man, you know God did. He, he did set us here to you know we are to be good stewards of the earth. But there's there's a problem. They're asking some right things or commenting on some right things. Yeah, God did put us here. We have dominion over the earth, but we're also to be good stewards of it. This is an our creation. This is God's creation that he put us in charge of, above, not below. So we are to be responsible with our use of that. And there are a lot of times we as humanity are irresponsible with that. There is actual pollution that does exist. But using something like that to jump to alarmist climate change, ooh, that's a big difference. That's a big, big difference. But they, this is going to be the downstream you're going to see is not <laughs> the overt manipulation that she's, she's uh, committing, but it's going to be rooted in the subtler things. It's going to be, well, yeah, you know, we do need to reduce pollution. Okay, yeah, I can agree with that. Fine. Pollution's not a good thing. What do you mean by pollution? What do you mean by reduce? What, what do you, who does that reduction? What is the avenue to get there? What is the, the ideology that you're actually intentionally or unintentionally pushing? What is the path forward? Because you see clearly in what uh, Catherine Hayo is, is pushing, there is very much an ideological bent to it that she wants to get rid of private ownership of things, or at least of anything she deems irresponsible. Uh, she sees herself as a superior Superior to the common person, but also their liberator. Well, that's called a tyrant. It's called a dictator. Uh, she sees herself, or she sees capitalism as a problem, exploitative. She sees the solution as very oppressive in order to end oppression. You know, this is probably a problem. But again, that is going to, that flows downhill. The people that listen to her 
that absorb a little bit of it and then transmit that on. They're also absorbing a little bit of the ideology. This is why it's important, again, to ask questions like, does that actually respond to the criticism? But also ask questions by, what do you mean? You know, what is the solution? You know, you're talking about the problem, but what's the solution? This is something that you'll notice, and this is a, a good place to lean into when you see this starting to creep in, is what's the solution? Because the problem is that people that buy into a lot of this stuff kind of passively, they haven't bought into the solutions, so they have no solutions. The problem is then they toss the solution. Well, we need a solution. They toss it up the chain because someone up the chain brings the solution. And now you've got this person that's eh, kind of sort of bought into it, but not really, but kind of. Well, then they look and go, oh, look, someone brought a solution. Let's go with that. That's how manipulation works. That's how the, this, this works. So your job, your job is to be a link breaker. Your job is to stand in the gap and say, well, be, be again, be clever about it. Be, be uh, wise. Wise as a serpent, instant as dove come in there when someone's talking about oh you know this this alarmist climate change we need to do something about it we have a biblical responsibility to it don't immediately treat them like you would Catherine here treat them as someone that, that Catherine's manipulated someone that you need to rescue go okay well well what's what's this what do you mean by x y and z what do you mean by climate change climate's always changing climate change exists but what do you mean by that? Oh, you mean alarmist man-made climate change? Hmm. Okay, that's that's something that hasn't been proven. Humanity changing things has not been proven. But but get, look, it's good that we got that definition out there. What's the solution? How do you, how do you see us responding? What what should we do? And they'll either, they're either going to say, I don't know. Or they're going to just go, oh, well, here's this solution that someone up the chain told me. Well, have you thought about that solution? What does that entail? What is the ideology that that promotes? Is that a responsible solution? Is that a biblically responsible solution? What do you mean when you say that the we have a biblical responsibility? to respond to, quote, climate change. Again, talking about your version, your uh, man-made alarmist climate change, formerly called global warming. Now, obviously, I'm not giving you an actual conversation because I'm being a little bit dramatic with it for the sake of, of displaying some things, but walk the person through what they mean at every step. because they've likely not consciously thought through these things. They've only been berated with them until it, it seeped in. So you're going to have to help them expose the beliefs that have been injected into them and then deconstruct those things. Yeah, there's a time when deconstruction is a good thing, and it's when you're dismantling a, a infection that's been injected into someone's belief system. Remove that infection, deconstruct that infection, and you're going to have to engage in the discipling process of building them up in the truth. You're going to have to be not only a link breaker, but a link maker. Gosh, this is turning into a, a, a it's turning into a generic sermon. I need more alliteration though. But <clears throat> I didn't mean that in a negative way. I'm just poking fun at, at modern pastors' love for using alliteration. I'm not immune to that. I'm not immune to that. It's fun. But you're going to have to be a link maker. They're pushing things down. They're, they're creating a chain, and they're pushing their ideology down it. you got to break people out of that one and put them in a biblical one. 
you're going to have to transmit proper teaching to them. But we have an advantage. It's called discipleship. We're not trying to manipulate them. We're trying to elevate them. In the manipulative side of things, they don't want people to be lifted up up the chain. They don't want people to become more educated. They want people to stay where they're at because that's where they can be manipulated. We want to disciple people. We want to take someone and lift them up, improve them, increase their knowledge, increase their, their understanding of God's word. We want to see them grow. Grow. Not grow in indoctrination, but actually grow. We want to see, you know, take these 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 spiritual babies, grow them up, see, teach them to walk, teach them to run, educate them, grow, and then watch them go out on their own. I don't mean that in a lone lone wolf Christian way. I mean that in the sense of they've grown up to the point where they're now a full adult in the faith. And they're able to carry that with them. They're now able to go and disciple other people in a strong, robust, and biblical way. That's our goal here. That's what we want to actually do. So with all that, I hope that's helpful. I hope that's got a lot of good thoughts moving in you. You're thinking through things. You're asking questions. You're thinking about people, individual people. You're going, hmm, Maybe this is a good place. I've struggled to have this conversation with this person. This has been a point, a pain point with us. But I feel like I've got a new approach, a little bit better of perspective, and I'm going to re-engage this. If anyone's feeling that way, that's a big encouragement. I'm glad that that was helpful. But as always, you can... Let us know. How was the episode? How can we improve? If it was useful for you, it might be for someone else. Share it with that person. Also, make sure to do those normal things like like, comment, share, subscribe. We want to make this a helpful resource that reaches people. And unsurprisingly, things like YouTube, uh, Spotify, all these other things don't like the type of content we have. No, it's not necessarily being suppressed, but the algorithms don't like to push it forward. So if it is helpful to you, it's on you to make sure that it it reaches more people. But again, if it's been helpful to anyone, that's enough for me. That's enough for me. I'll be okay with one person. I'll be okay with 10,000 people. God's put me here for a specific purpose, a specific reason, and I'm going to act on that, whoever comes. That's one of the attitudes we need to have. Stop focusing on numbers and focus in on being faithful to where God's put you. So God bless you. We hope this has been helpful to you. And remember, don't go woke. Don't go woke.